Good morning. I'm Shane. I'm one of the pastors. And if you're a guest or you're new, welcome. You're joining us on a journey through the book of Romans. And you're actually joining us on a mini journey through Romans 8. Because uh, this will be our sixth week in Romans 8. Uh, partly because it's one of my favorite chapters in the whole Bible, and partly because I'm stalling to get to Romans 9, because it's a tough t- chapter, and, and it's possible uh, after last week, uh, uh, many of you came hoping for Romans 9 today. Uh, next, ne- well, next time I preach, we'll do Romans 9. Um, it's also possible some of you came uh, hoping to hear me talk about hell which would be a weird topic, but I, I, I said some things last week that I just quickly want to address, just kind of stick my finger in the hole of the dam uh, for now, because uh, I, I touched a nerve apparently uh, last week uh, when I said some things about hell that just kind of caused a firestorm on social media and phew, Shane's a heretic and first three churches off the rails, and, and uh, it was interesting, uh, it, really interesting to me that uh, so many people from other churches pay such close attention to what we do here, like it's got to be a lot to keep track of, but in any event, um, I, 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 listen, 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 I know me, I live with me, I know I say a lot of things that I probably shouldn't say sometimes, like I know I say a lot of things, I got a wife, I go home sometimes and she's like, you know that thing you said, yeah, that was really funny, don't ever say that again, um, <laughs> I know, I know, I know, right? So there's things I say that should get me in trouble at times. What I said last week about hell is not one of them. Like, not even in the top hundred. Like, all I said is, uh, and I will preach on this, uh, in Romans 9.22, when it talks about uh, the objects of God's wrath that were prepared for destruction, I will talk about uh, the view of uh, suffering in hell that is destruction. As Paul said, they're prepared for destruction. There is a, uh, the traditional view of hell, as I said last week, that Christians have is it's a place of eternal conscious torment, that uh, God is causing people to suffer consciously in torment for eternity. It's the traditional view. I also said uh, it's not the only view. There is an alternative view, an evangelical view, uh, that believes uh, hell is a place of eternal destruction. And I didn't even say it was my view. I mean, it is, but I didn't even say that. Imagine if I had said that. People really would have freaked out. Good thing I didn't say that. It is my view, but it, the point is it, it doesn't make any difference. It's not, it, it doesn't matter if it's my view or not. It just is a view. The point I was making is it just is a view. Like it just is. It just is. I didn't make it up. Like it just is. It is a legitimate evangelical view. Like it has been uh, for 2,000 years. Uh, Go back to the first century with Ignatius, the early church father. It was his view. Irenaeus, second century, greatest church historian ever. It was his view. All the way through church history, modern church history, C.S. Lewis, John Stott, uh, uh, many, many evangelical pastors, scholars, theologians, and Christians today uh, hold to this few. Uh, Preston Sprinkle, who wrote the book, he's a very respected evangelical scholar who wrote the book, he co-authored the book Erasing Hell uh, with Francis Chan. Just get on his website. He's got several brilliant articles in defense of uh, that view. It is just a legitimate evangelical view. Uh, and so, listen, it's just, it's not a thing. It's not worth being worked up about. It's certainly not worth dividing over. It's not worth fighting over. And I will explain it uh, when we get to Romans 9. Um, I, everything in me, wanted to go there today. Everything in me uh, wanted to go there uh, today. God just said, no, Junior, finish Romans 8. Uh, so God wins, and we are preaching and finishing uh, Romans 8. So that's all I want to say about that. Just That's my desire to stick a finger in the dam and uh, just uh, give me a chance. I will get to Romans 9, and we'll talk about it. But for today, I want to ask you a question uh, to get you thinking about where uh, God is taking us and what he wants to say to us today. So the question, I want you to think about it. The question is, um, have you ever had someone in your life that you care about, uh, I could be a, a friend, a spouse, child, parent. Um, they're in just a really difficult situation. And, and, you know, it's just all falling apart. It's uh, for whatever reason. Maybe, maybe 
uh, they did nothing uh, to deserve it, uh, life's just happening, or maybe they just made some horrible choices and got themselves in a horrible situation, uh, got a drunk driving ticket, they, they, committed, they, had, they had an affair, they got caught uh, in a pornography addiction, and life is just spinning out of control, and everything's falling apart. Whatever the situation is, you've had someone in your life, whether it's no fault of their own or it actually is their fault, it's just they're scared, they're confused, they don't know how it's going to work out, they feel alone, and they're just terrified, and, and very difficult season. Have you ever known someone in a season like this, in a situation like this, and you love them, uh, and cared about them, and so you just looked them in the eyes, and you said to them, I'm for you. I'm for you. And you meant it. Or, or, maybe you've been the one in the jam, and you felt terrified. And maybe it was no fault of your own, or maybe you just made some horrible choices. And you didn't know what you're going to do, how it's going to work out, you're scared. And then someone that loves you looked you in the eyes and said, I'm for you. I have uh, said those words. I've been on both sides of that. I've said those words and I've received those words. I mean, you're thinking right now, what kind of jams you get yourself in, Shane? Not pertinent to the sermon. <laughs> God knows because he knows everything. Uh, it, it, but but uh, when I've said those words to people, I haven't said those words. I have said those words many times. I haven't said those words to many people uh, because those are uh, significant words to me. And words are significant. Words are powerful. Yes? Something Christians need to remember. Words are very significant. Words are very powerful. Uh, the Bible says life and death is in the power of the tongue. The Bible says that we're going to give an account for every careless word we've spoken because of the power of words. And so I try my best to say what I mean and mean what I say. So those aren't words that I've said to many people. They are words I've said Many times, because when I say those words, they're significant words. Because when I say to someone that I love, who's in a difficult situation, terrified, don't know how it's going to work out, all that stuff, I, I mean far more than, hey, dude, cheering for you, hope that works out, I'll be over here watching. That's not what I mean when I say I'm for them. I mean much more than that, and so I don't say it to many people because I recognize if I say those words and I mean those words, it could cost me. It cost me my time. It cost me my money. Because, because what I mean when I say I am for you is I am with you. I am with you. You are not alone in this situation. I'm going to walk through you with it. If you need help and I have it, I'll give it to you. If you need resources and I have those resources, I will share them with you. That's what I mean when I say to someone, I am for you. It means I'm with you. It means I'll help you. It means you don't have to worry about walking through this horrific season of your life by yourself. And, and, and again, I, I haven't said those words to many people. I've said it many times uh, because cause it can cost, <laughs> so I'm careful about saying those words. Uh, it, but I'm a dad, so clearly there's four people I've said those words to many times. Some of those four more than others because they've needed them more than others. And then the, the most recent one I've ex I told you guys about about a month ago is when my 17-year-old son uh, told me he was going to be a dad. And oh, and by, just by the way, uh, everyone, lots of people ask me, uh, my grandson, uh, Baby Bear, he's doing great. He's out of the NICU. He got to come home a few weeks ago. He's up to eight pounds. He's a Holden. So he's, he's, uh, he's, he's so awesome. He's so awesome. First time I got to hold that little baby, I was like, ah, I can't believe you can feel this much love for any human being. It just more further proof to me of Romans 8, 28, that God works for the good in all things. Uh, for those who love him and are called according to his purposes. Amen? Uh, so, so, uh, but, but, but anyway, 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 that's a bunny trail uh, already. Um, uh, I just, uh, back to the situation, I just think about like, when, when he had to wrestle with that situation himself like, before he told me. And, and what he had to be feeling himself in, in a situation like that. Like, regardless of whether a 17-year-old junior in high school should be in that situation or not, at that point it doesn't matter because you're in the situation. 
So, so, so all the different emotions and, and things you'd be feeling, uh, you, know, you know, like, I, I, like what, 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 is my life over? Am I going to go to college? Like, I, 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 don't, I can't even provide for myself. How can I provide uh, for a child? Like, all of those natural questions and emotions, aside from the, like, what's my dad going to do? You know, like, is my dad going to kill me? Is, is my dad going to be ashamed of me? Is my dad going to reject me? Is my dad going to be disappointed with me? Is it going to ruin my friendship with my dad? Like, what's the church going to think? He's a pastor. Like, all those uh, things that, that you would think it has to be a very, very intense and emotional uh, moment. And, and so I, when, when he gave me the news, uh, the, the, the main thing I tried to communicate to him in that moment from me and his mom and his brothers and his sister is, I'm with you. I'm with you. I am for you. I am for you. We are for you. We are with you. You are not alone. And what I meant in that moment was far more than, hey, buddy, hope it works out. Well, what I meant was we're, we're in it with you, man. You're not alone. You're, we're your family. You're my son. I, we're going we're gonna to walk this thing out together. Like I, I know you don't have resources to provide for a child, but I do. Well, at least for now. I do. And... <laughs> As long as me and mom do, you do, until you have the resources to provide for yourself. Whatever we have, you have. It's, it's all yours. We are with you. We are with you. And obviously, the path to this incredible blessing that we call Baby Bear was not the path we'd have picked. But it doesn't matter. Because he is my son. And that is my grandson. And I am for them. I am for him. I have four children. If they were sitting here, they would say to you, yep, he's for us. I'm always for them. I'm only for them, all of them. And, and, and that means I, I am with them, and I'll always be there to help them when they need my help, whatever the situation is, whether they should be in the situation or not. If they need my help, I will be there. I will help them. You know, there's a, uh, there's a picture uh, from the baptism uh, when I think about what I mean when I say to one of my kids, I am for you, there, th th that picture caps captures it. I'm not going to look because I'll cry. That's me getting to baptize my 17-year-old son. That baptism service was one of the most epic services I've ever been a part of in my whole entire life. We baptized so many people, and that, that right there was the highlight of the evening for me. A close second was baptizing Mae McDowell. Oh, my gosh. Like, I got done baptizing Mae. I kissed her on the head, and I just like, Mae, I should resign right now. Like, I should just go out on top. Like, what's left to do after you've baptized May McDowell? After reading some of those Facebook posts, I should have resigned on top. <laughs> Darn it. it. It could have been like Brady going out after a Super Bowl win. You know, like I should have. Uh, oh, oh, no, he's not going to win? <laughs> oh, I had touched another nerve. Like, I'm, I, I don't care who wins. <laughs> but that picture, uh, when I say... I am for my children. Uh, that I'm for. That's that's it. Whether they're doing good or they're doing bad or they're performing well, they're, that's it. I when I say I am for them, that's that that picture couldn't capture it better than that. And I, and I want you to look at that picture not because it's me and my son. I want you to look at that picture for a minute, and I, and I want you to understand uh, that 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 uh, Jesus said uh, in Matthew seven uh, seven through eleven that uh, my heart uh, for my children, as fierce as it is, is uh, so weak and frail uh, compared to the Father's heart for you that the only word he could use to differentiate it is evil. My love. For my children is so fierce. Yet Jesus says, compared to the Father's love for you, it is evil. This is what I mean when I say I am for my children, and my heart for my kids is so weak compared to the Father's heart for you that it's evil. Why do I say all that? Because I want you to hear this, and I want it to land uh, with the thud that God wants it to land with. Romans 8.31, where we pick up our journey today in the book of Romans, picking up right where we left off last week, the Apostle Paul says to you, God 
is for you. God is for you. Like, if my heart is evil compared to his heart for you, like, what does that mean that he is for you? I mean, how must he love you? If his love for you is so much more beautiful and extravagant and powerful than my love for my kids, that my love compared to his love for you is evil, I mean, how must he love you? The emotions that must course through the being of God when he looks upon your life. And then even those seasons when, 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 when you're in trouble and you've taken a left when you should have taken a right. He is for you. It means that he is with you. It means he will always be with you. It means he will always be for you. It means he will walk through every difficult situation with you. And he will th help you through it if you ask for his help. Whether or not he would have chosen the situation for you doesn't matter. If you took a right and he wanted you to take a left, he's not going to leave you alone and abandon you. He is your father. He is with you. He is for you. He doesn't suddenly turn, he doesn't say, I am for you. And then suddenly turn against you uh, when you made a choice he didn't want you to make. And I'm saying that because I sometimes think Christians feel that way. Like, 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 like they, they blew it. They made a bad choice. And now, now these bad things are happening in their life because God is punishing them. And, 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 and he's turned against them as if he is suddenly opposed to them. He is not against you. The Bible says that God is for you. It means that God is always for you. And then what he wants you to know today is that when the Apostle Paul says in Romans 8.31 that he is for you, it means that he is for you in the good times and the bad times, and he is for you when you're feeling extra close to him and overcoming areas of weakness and sin and reading your Bible every day and walking in all kinds of obedience, and he is also for you in the seasons when it feels like the enemy is doing a tap dance on your head and you feel like you have no strength to overcome any area of temptation. He is still for you for you. He is always for you. He is always with you and he will always help you if you ask him for his help. Always. Why? Why is he for you? Why? Because he is your father. Because you have been adopted into his family if you put your faith in Jesus Christ. Not because you deserve it, but because he is your father. And my guess is, it's not a guess, it's more than a guess, it's based on 25 years of being a pastor. My experience tells me that uh, some of you in this room struggle to believe that, and some of you watching online struggle to uh, believe that. And there's probably lots of reasons that some of us struggle to believe that God is for us, that he's always for us, that he's only for us. And uh, some of it could be because um, maybe you grew up uh, like I grew up in a very difficult situation that makes it hard for you to believe that God is really for you. Or, or maybe it's because of the uh, picture that uh, religion painted of God for you as if he's angry and hard to please and only gives you his love and help and favor and affection when you're performing perfectly and always towing the line, which is uh, difficult because none of us obey perfectly or always tow the line. Uh, or may, may, maybe it's because of the landscape of your life. You just look at it and you're like, it doesn't feel like or look like God is for me. And it's hard for you to believe this. And maybe some of you even want to believe me when I tell you uh, that God is for you in these ways. Uh, but it just, it's, it just sounds too good to be true, and you think to yourself, uh, Shane's just trying to make us feel good again. So God has an agenda today, and his agenda is to convince you that if you are his child, that he is for you, and he's trying to convince you of this uh, through what I believe to be some of the most beautiful verses in the entire New Testament, and I feel this way about these verses because they so clearly reveal God's heart for us, while at the same time so clearly revealing one of Satan's greatest strategies against us that is designed to talk us out of believing the truth that Paul just told us that God is for us. So I guess his goal, his agenda is twofold today, to convince you that he's for you always, no matter what, if you are a believer, and at the same time to expose Satan's strategies to talk you out of believing this, starting with verse 31. We'll just unpack uh, these verses, and, 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 it, and it's this series of questions. It's this torrent of questions uh, that the Apostle Paul 
uh, is, uh, is, is, is asking. Paul did this at times. Paul would question things at times, and he would question those things uh, out loud, and he had a reason for that, and he's clearly doing that uh, in this text, and I find it fascinating and beautiful. But he starts in verse 31 uh, when he says, What then shall we say uh, in response to all these things? If God is for us, who uh, can be against us? And, and I want you to understand uh, when he asks this question here, in 31b, it's not a typical question. Like, I wonder if God is for us, and if God were for us, uh, what would that mean? That is not what he's doing here. This is a reflection. This is like a... <sighs> he, he, he really, like, like, this isn't the only time Paul does this. There's places where... Uh, Paul is uh, he's writing under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, you know? like, and, and, and there's times when the Apostle Paul, I think he just picks his pen up and is like, what? That's so awesome. And then that's what's happening here. He's blowing a gasket a little bit. Not the only time uh, he does it. He's, he's, we, he just got done writing Romans 8.28. Like, what's he meaning in response to all what? Well, in response to everything he's written up to this point, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, but specifically in response to what he just said in verses 28 through 30, which is what? Like, what did he just say? We talked about it last week. He's like, he's thinking about it. He's like reflecting on it. He's like, what are we even supposed to say to that? How do we even respond to all of that? Like, we know for sure that in all things, God works for our good, even in the painful things that he didn't want us to experience, and he still works for good even in those things to transform us more into the image of Christ so everything can have significant meaning in my life no matter what. And we know for sure that if we're justified, we are glorified, that, that we can live right now on the earth as people who have put our faith in Jesus Christ, knowing the end game because it's been predestined, it's God's predetermined plan for us that we will be completely conformed to the image of Jesus Christ, like we are glorified. We get to live right now on this earth knowing that God's plans can't be thwarted, that whatever happens in our lives, we will be with him forever in paradise and we'll be just like him. We live every day knowing no matter what happens here, we win for eternity. That's what he's saying. And now he's saying, what are you even supposed to say in response to all that? What do you, what do you say? If God is for us in those ways, then who could be against us? What could be against us? Now, now, he's not saying that people won't be against you. Well, they will sometimes. He's not saying that life won't be against you. It will sometimes. He's not saying that the devil himself won't be against you at times. He will. What he's saying is who or what can actually be against you what can anyone, anything, any demon do to you on this earth that actually matters in any significant way in light of what God has done for you? Who can be against you in a way that really matters when all of that is true of who you are? And beloved, if you put your faith in Jesus Christ, God is for you in all those ways and many more, and he wants you to believe it, and he knows how hard this is for some of us to believe because of our own past sin and failures, because of our present struggles with sin, or simply because our lives may presently look like a train wreck. So he wants doubt to go on. He wants to, he wants to diff diffuse it, and, 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 and he knows this is going to be hard for some of us to believe that God is really for us like this. So he has Paul ask a series of questions following the first question that are designed to put all those doubts to death starting in verse 32 with one of the most beautiful verses in the New Testament. This is what he says. He says, he, speaking of the Father, who did not spare his own son, speaking of Jesus, he who did not spare his own son, he did not spare his own son, but gave him up, freely surrendered him for us all. Who did he give him up for? Us all. All, all, all. So, so all means all in the original Greek language. And that would mean that all is inclusive of you. And you? And you, and you, and you, right? Right? So, it would be okay if I read this and said, 
He who did not spare his own son but gave him up for you. That would be okay, yes? That wouldn't get me in trouble? Because you are included in all. So he did not spare his own son. How, how, how do you suppose the father feels about the son? Why, what do you think? One for eternity past. Yet he did not spare his own son, but gave him up for you. <laughs> How will he not then also along with him graciously, the word graciously means generously and with joy, then give you all things. I, like, I almost feel like I should just say amen right now. Get the worship team back out here and we should just celebrate the love of God. Like, I'm afraid to say anything about it because it's so, but I, I'm, gonna, I'm just going to ruin it. I, I mean, could it get more beautiful than this? Like, like th this is like, this is like God himself bending over the balcony of heaven and then and, and, and grabbing all of us in our weakness and brokenness and our fear and our shame and our doubts. And it's like he's, putting his hands on our, on our faces and lifting our heads up so he can look us in the eyes. And with a giant smile on his face, this is him saying, just in case you ever wonder, just in case you are ever prone to doubt how I feel about you, just in case you ever struggle to believe that I could really be for you, look at the cross. Just look. This is how I feel about you. About you, about you, about you. I did not spare my own son, but gave him up for you. This is the hearts of God for you. I uh, take some heat at times for some of the things I say. One of the things I take heat for is... Uh, being accused of preaching a man-centric gospel. You make it all about man. So I just want to say something out loud to everyone. Guilty as charged. Because I, I, I mean, like he did, it seems like we were in his heart. It seems like we're the reward of his suffering. It seems as if the Father is saying to us, I, 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 look, I looked, I saw an eternity past. I knew what it would cost me. Because Jesus is the lamb that was slain before the foundations of the world. And, and, and so in eternity past, uh, uh, God knew full well that for him to have you and I uh, to be his sons and daughters and to be reconciled to him and adopted into his family, that this price was going to have to be paid. Amen? Like he saw it. He knew. He knew. So, so, so in eternity past, he, he saw this moment. He saw this moment in eternity past. And, and he saw your life. And he knew that to have you for his daughter would cost him his son, and he still wanted you. Ah! That is beautiful. Some of you, you think your lives don't matter. You, you, you think you're insignificant. Maybe because you look at the situations and you see what you see and, and you believe those lies, but you couldn't be more significant because he who did not spare his own son gave him up for you. And, 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 and do you remember when he did this? Do you, 
See, 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 Romans, oh my gosh, the book of Romans, I've been here for a long time, it, it's layers upon layers, it's, but Paul, it builds on itself, right? And then do you remember when, when uh, did the father freely give his son, do you remember when, back to Romans 5, 8, do you remember when? When you were still a sinner, God demonstrates his own love for us in this, Paul said, that while we were still sinners, uh, God gave his son for us. Like that. I mean, my goodness. Like, 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 that means when, when we were his enemies. Like, like when, when I was still a sinner, it means when I, when, Shane, when I was at my worst, and I was really bad. When I was living my worst version of my life. When I was giving into all kinds of radical immorality and party in my guts out and mocking God and his word with the way I lived my life. When I was his greatest enemy, he died for me. Guess how he felt about me while I was his enemy. And that's why Paul said in Romans 5, 9, and 10, then how much more, remember? How much more then, how much more then does God delight in you and enjoy you now, even in your weakness, if you're a sincere believer, having been reconciled to the Father through the Son, how much more if he felt like that about you while you were his enemy, how much more does his Father delight in you now that you've been adopted into his family, even in your weakness, how much more can you believe the truth that he is for you, that he is with you, that he will always only be for you, that he will always only be with you. And if you are ever prone to doubt that, beloved, just look at that cross. Because that is still God bending over the balcony of heaven, looking down upon us and screaming to all of us who are weak and broken and prone to doubt, you need never wonder, you need never doubt, this is how I feel about you. And not only that, we can just go back to Romans 8, 32. Man, we just, maybe we'll have seven weeks in Romans 8. Listen, how will he not also along with him then graciously give us all things? Like, so, so, okay, so God is saying to us, this is what I did for you, even while you were my enemy. This is how I feel about you. I was willing to not spare my own son for you. So, so how much more will I graciously, generously, freely with joy give you all things if I was willing to give you that? That is an overwhelming statement, yes? Now, now many times I've had someone ask me the question, well, what does all things mean? That he will graciously and generously and freely give us all things. I don't know. Like, how can I know that? You know, like, I, I think it's funny that sometimes people think I should know something that the Bible doesn't say. Because the Bible doesn't say it. Like, like, Paul doesn't say he'll give you all things. By all things, I mean these seven. Right? You can read for it. Like, he just, that's all he says. And then he starts dropping more love bombs after this. So, so, so I don't obviously know for sure what God means when he says he'll give us all things. So this is opinion. Uh, in my opinion, it has to be inclusive of everything we'll experience when we leave this earth, right? We're co-heirs of God and co-heirs with Christ. So clearly it's speaking of all things being eternal, the inheritance that we have, that we're kings and priests, that we will rule and reign with God forever in paradise. So I, in my opinion, it has to be inclusive of that. In my opinion, it has to also be inclusive of, of the reality that God has given us the Holy Spirit and he's given us everything we need to live the life he's called us to live. It's gotta be inclusive of that. And, 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 and also in my opinion, it's practical. I, I, what I'm saying is I think this means that God doesn't want me, I ask his son, you as his son or daughter, to uh, live like a spiritual pauper, uh, uh, believing that we could never be deserving enough uh, to go to him, to receive from him uh, in times of genuine need. Because, because many Christians do. They live this way. And so they have uh, times in their life when they need God to break in. And they, 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 they need to go to him and cry out uh, for him to, to move. But they don't because they feel like uh, they're not worthy and I think this should have an impact on that because, because we weren't worthy of this to begin with, amen? I mean, it was not about what we deserve and so I do think that, that, un that God wants us to understand like, hey, 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 if, if I was willing to do that for you, how much more am I willing to help you 
in genuine times of need on your life. Like I want you to see me as a good father, understanding who I am and come to me in your times of need, believing uh, that I will meet your needs. Now, 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 obviously the other side of that is uh, I, I've heard this uh, turned into uh, all things meaning like, uh, you know, like, like prosperity stuff, like, like if God was willing to do that for you and he's willing to give you all things, like he'll give you a new Cadillac, you know, like all things means just ask God for Cadillac, 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 and poof, he'll give you one or uh, uh, you, like you're always going to have whatever you want. And uh, I, I understand, uh, I'm not, I understand how uh, they jump to that conclusion uh, just from reading this. I, I don't personally think that's uh, the point the Apostle Paul is making <laughs> for lots of reasons. But one, is because the Apostle Paul is the one that's writing this under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, right? Like that wasn't his experience. All things to Paul didn't mean everything he wanted. Clearly, right? He's in prison. He's beat constantly, stoned, shipwrecked, abandoned, abused. He's lost everything. Lost his job because of Jesus, his 401K, his house, everything. This man is suffering. I don't think the Apostle Paul was wanting to get beat in the face over and over again for preaching Jesus. I don't think that's what he wanted. So I saw his experience wasn't that. I don't think that's what's in Paul's heart as he's writing these words under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit. In my opinion, this really is God saying, if I gave my son for you, how, how, how will I also not give you everything in the eternal city to share with him? How will I not also give you everything you need to live the life I've called you to live on this earth? And how will not, I also not be willing to help you in your times of need? If you'll ask. And maybe that's his heart for someone today. What, maybe he just wants you to ask. Hey, what do you need today? What do you need? Not what do you want. Not, what do you need? Are you, are you carrying bitterness in your heart? Is lust controlling or tormenting you? Is there some addiction or attitude of sin that's paralyzing you and destroying your relationships? Is there pain in your body? Are, are there more bills than there is money? Ask him. If he was willing to not spare his own son, how will he not also along with him graciously, generously, and with joy give you all things? He is for you. He is always for you. That means he is with you. Next question. Verse 33. Okay, now, now, this is where, uh, this is where um, God uh, reveals his heart to us and at the same time starts to expose uh, some of the enemy's activity in our lives. Um, to talk us out of believing his heart for us. And I really believe this. And so Satan's activity in these two verses, in my opinion, is exposed. And so I really want to ask you to press in and, 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 and focus. Uh, because if Satan's activities are exposed here, I, my guess is that he would do everything he can to keep people uh, from hearing and understanding. And God wants you, in my opinion, to hear and understand this. The question is, who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen, because it is God who justifies. Okay, so we've talked about that at length. If you put your faith in Jesus Christ, uh, you are justified. You are just as if you had never sinned, and because you are justified, it means you are innocent, and because you are innocent, uh, charges of guilt cannot be brought uh, against you. It really goes back to Romans 8.1. I know it was a long time ago, but we're still in Romans 8. And he started this whole line of thinking with Romans 8.1, which was there is present tense right now, no condemnation, no guilt for those who are what? For those who are in Christ Jesus. It means if you're in Christ, you put your faith in. It's not about your performance or your behavior. If you're in Christ, you put your faith in Jesus and his sacrifice for you on the cross, uh, then you are uncondemnable. You can't be condemned. It means you're innocent and you can never be found guilty. Okay, so, so what Paul is saying here is, is, is we are so innocent, and, and why are we innocent in God's eyes and uncondemnable in God's eyes? Why? Because we're in Christ, because we're justified, because we talked about it in Romans 4. When we put our faith in Jesus Christ, the righteousness of Jesus was imputed uh, to us. We get credit for his righteousness. So when God looks at our lives, he doesn't see our lives. We get credit for Jesus' life. Our life is hidden with God in Christ. So you are innocent, innocent, innocent. You are so innocent that you can't even have charges of guilt brought against you before God. And, and, and if you're like me, you could be thinking to yourself, well, I don't know about that. Sure, seems like someone could at least bring charges against me, right? And by that, I mean you could be thinking to yourself, at least one or two Christians in this room uh, could be thinking, well, I still sin once in a while. Well, anyone? One, one or two of us? Anyone sin ever as a Christian? 
Okay, and then First John says, if you say you're without sin, you're a liar, so that's everyone else. Okay, and so we all know this, right? We sin. And so it seems like there are things that charges could be brought against us for, and your enemy, the devil, he's very aware of this, right? He knows this is the case, so he uh, works nonstop uh, to accuse you uh, for your sin and to convince you uh, that God is disappointed with you and disgusted with you and that you are guilty before God. And in many Christians uh, I tend to believe those lies, and we end up living feeling guilty before God, even though we know that we're innocent, but we live feeling like failures. God's probably mostly disappointed with me because what the enemy does is uh, tempts you, and uh, you give in to that. And then some Christians think it's temptation that causes them to live buried under shame and guilt and condemnation. And I understand why they think that, but is it really? Like, is it really temptation that causes sincere Christians to live feeling like failures before God and that God couldn't really be for them? Is it really? Is it really even giving in to temptation? Is it really? Or is it the stick the devil beats you in the head with after you give in to that temptation as he whispers in your ear to convince you that you're a disgusting, guilty failure in the eyes of God? Because this is what he does. He is the accuser. He accuses. Now, Revelation 12.10 says that Satan accuses day and night, night and day, before the throne of God. Revelation 12.10 says this. It says it. Uh, and he's accusing us to, to God, night and day, day and night. He is the accuser. Uh, but he doesn't just accuse us to God. He accuses us to us as well. Here's the point. Paul is saying in Romans 8.33, who can bring an accusation against us before God? It's a question he's asking. And then in Romans 8.34, in Romans 8.34, he asks another question. Who is the one that condemns? Who can say we're guilty? Who can bring an accusation? Who can say we're guilty? And what's his answer? His ultimate answer is no one. So no one can in real life, but it doesn't keep Satan from trying. And he does this constantly through accusation. I, we've all heard it. See, Satan accuses you to God, God to you, and you to you. And his accusation of you to you is the powerful one that if we believe can lead us to live feeling buried under condemnation. It, because, because what I mean is this, like, yeah, let's just say you blow it, you gave into that whatever again. And, and as soon as you do, he's right there in your ear, isn't he? He's right there. You, do you really love God? Really? Do you really call yourself a Christian? Really? Like, you think God really loves you? You think your future is secure? You really think you're going to heaven when you die? You really think you're a spirit-filled, born-again Christian? Really? You think God delights in you and enjoys you? Really? I mean, how long have you been a Christian? Five years? Ten years? Twenty-five years? And you still can't control your temper? You're still so arrogant and haughty? You still struggle with alcohol? You just gave in to porn again? God has probably had just about enough of you. He's probably disgusted with you. You're just a failure. He doesn't delight in you. Accusation, accusation. And what happens to a lot of us is we agree with it. And that's when the strongholds start to get built. We say, ah, it's probably true. And the reason his accusations are so powerful is because what he's accusing us of is true right? Like the behavior is true. That's why it's so powerful. Like what I mean is if Satan came to accuse me and said, you're a bank robber. I'd be like, shut up. It wouldn't bother me at all. I don't rob a bank. But if he accuses me of pride, I'm like, oh, right? Because that's true. Uh, I do struggle with things like that. So it's true. And, 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 and so we, I, well, I, just, I do struggle with that. So yeah. Maybe God really does feel, maybe God, maybe I just am a failure. Maybe God is disappointed with me. And what happens is we start to live as sincere Christians feeling guilty even though we know that we are innocent and uncondemnable. And this thing called condemnation that so many of us live under locks our hearts up. 
I mean, it keeps us ineffective for the kingdom of God. We're not going to be using our gifts to reach out to people. It keeps us uh, from going to God with confidence and prayer, believing that we're children, that he's always for us. It ultimately undermines the very thing that the apostle Paul is telling us. It keeps us from believing fully that God is for us. We start to wonder and doubt if he could really be for us in those ways because we're so weak and we're so broken and we're so guilty. And so what God wants us to understand in Romans 8, 33 and 34 is what it says in Revelation 12, 10. It is not just that Satan accuses you to you. It's also that he accuses you to God. And I have struggled with condemnation uh, fiercely as a young Christian. And this understanding more than anything helped me to kill that beast because what God uh, wants us to know is how he deals with Satan's accusations against us uh, because then we can just agree with God. Amen? They, like, just instead of agreeing with the devil, we just agree with God. So, so what happens? Well, I, yeah, Romans 8, 34, I'll read it all. Who then is the one who condemns? No one. Christ Jesus who died more than that was raised to life is the right hand of God and is also interceding for us. Okay, so, so the word interceding uh, can mean to pray. Here it means uh, to plead one's case. Okay, so, so Jesus is at the right hand of God pleading uh, your case. So who is he that condemns? Who is he that accuses? Well, no one really can, but we know Satan still tries. And, and, and so, 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 so just make, I'll make it as simple as I can. I, I think of it like a, like a courtroom situation, right? And, 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 and Satan is like, uh, he's like my uh, uh, prosecuting attorney. And, and he, I'll just focus on me. He he just, uh, he's, he's coming to God uh, with accusations against me. And uh, he's going he's gonna to give an argument. And, 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 and he wants God to agree with him that I'm guilty because of his argument. And so he's, uh, he's a good prosecuting attorney. So he has like the last month of my life. And every sin in my last month. So there'd be at least two. Um, he's got it all though. He's got every dumb thing I said. Everything I shouldn't have said that I said. So he's probably got a whole bunch of stuff. He's got all the things I thought, uh, the sin that nobody else, he's got it all, man. Every sin from the last 30 days. A PowerPoint presentation, uh, you know, s uh, sermon clips, he's got it all. And, and, and he's making his case uh, there before uh, the father. And, and, and then he gets done and he says, uh, he, he's guilty. He belongs, he's not yours, he, he's guilty. Give him to me. And, and so the question is, then, what does the father do with those accusations? It's a big deal, right? Uh, so so well, I guess one question would be, do you think God's surprised? You know, like, do you think, like, like God was, he's in heaven at the desk, you know, just doing God work in the office. And then and, and, and Satan just came and gave him an envelope with new information across his desk about me. And God opens up the vanilla folder and reads the information. And like it's the first time he's ever seen this. And he's just like, what? What? He what? He what? You're thinking, what did you do? I'm not telling you. <laughs> I, I didn't know. Did anyone know? D Gabriel, did you know? Michael, what about? Sean, how about you? Did you know? Like, he's, a, he's a mess. Did anyone know this? I got that in. Like, do you think that's happening? Do you think God is surprised? Like he's getting this new information about me across his desk that is now causing him to reevaluate how he feels about me? Does anyone in this room believe that to be true? No. He's not getting any new info. We're talking about the all-knowing, all-powerful, omniscient one. He knows everything about me. He is getting no new information about me. So clearly he is not surprised. I think we're surprised sometimes. That we're so broken and we still sin with certain, right? Like, sincere, I think sometimes we're so, my God, I can't believe I just blew it there again. Can you? And he's like, yeah. Yeah. There's a lot more where that came from. I'm just showing you the tip of the iceberg, Shane, because uh, I want to help you deal with it. I showed you all. You probably combust. I'm just showing you a little bit. Yeah, no, I'm not surprised. It's a lot worse than you think. <laughs> I'm not surprised. So, so, so is he disappointed? Is he disgusted? Is he like, ugh? Gross. So does it. What a failure. Or does he just ultimately agree with the devil? You're right. He, is, he did do all that. He is guilty. Take him. He's yours. What happens? Well, Paul tells us if we are believers, if we are in Christ, we have a defense attorney. Yea, more than a defense attorney. 
Christ Jesus who died and was raised to life is at the Father's right hand and he's pleading your case. That means he stands up to defend me. And he looks at the Father and the Father looks to his right where his son is standing with scars and his hands and his feet in his side. And he says, what say you, son? And Jesus speaks up on my behalf and he says, um, that's not true, Father, not true. <laughs> I don't... I don't know for sure what happens then, but I bet you Satan's not happy. He probably just like, some evil hissy. Because Satan says, it is true. It's all true. Everything I just presented is true. He did all of that. And then Jesus is probably like, oh, yeah, that's all true. (laughs) That's way worse than that. He didn't even show you all of it. (laughs) Yeah. Yeah, Shane's really a mess. Oh, no, it's far worse than that. Yeah, 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 that's all true. That's all true. He really is that broken. Yeah, yeah, all true, all true, yeah. But, Father, what's not true is that he's guilty. Because you chose him. And you justified him. Father, you, you, who is he? Who is he? And how dare he darken your counsel? with accusations against one whom you have chosen, one whom you have justified. Father, you dropped the gavel. You declared him innocent. You declared him not guilty. He has put his faith in my shed blood for the forgiveness of his sins. My righteousness was imputed to that one. He has been adopted. He is your son. You have justified him. How dare he bring accusations against one whom you have justified. He has no rights. And the father agrees with the son. And he looks at the devil and he says, be gone. You have no right to bring an accusation or a charge against one of my sons or daughters whom I have justified. So, are you weak? Yes or no? Do you sin? Yes or no? Are you guilty? Yes or no? No. Agree with God. And and, and, and it's a... Some of you, I just feel God's heart for you. You've been living for so many years, just sincere Christian, feeling like a failure, just buried under condemnation. God just wants to break those chains today by helping you understand what he does with Satan's accusations against you so you will just agree with him. There's a Christian in this room, and you've wondered, what, 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 where's the joy? I, where's that abundant life that Jesus talked about? I don't. This is God's invitation to you to taste that joy, to taste that abundant life. You are his innocent, beloved son or daughter, and he is for you. Which leads to the last question that I'm going to ask as the worship team comes out. What then, who then, shall separate us from the love of Christ? Uh, and and, and it, it, it's, uh, it's a natural question for Paul to end this with because uh, what he's saying is, who shall pull us away From the one who bled for us. Who shall pull us away uh, from the one who sacrificed his son freely for us to make us his sons and daughters? Who? What? Could ever pull us from him? Because it does seem like the world is trying to do this all the time, doesn't it? It just seems like everything is designed to pull us away from this. And sometimes you might wonder and sometimes you might feel like your heart is being pulled away and everything's dark and you're confused. And Paul is answering the question and he, he, he says, he says, shall trouble or hardship, the difficult things in your life, can, can those things pull you away? The trials you experience and maybe even those seasons of wondering where God is, can those things pull you away from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus, our persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword? Verses 38 and 39. Paul says this. Now remember who's saying this. Paul the apostle, greatest theologian in church history besides Jesus himself. Agree? Greatest theologian in church history besides Jesus himself. Fully inspired by the Holy Spirit, 
as he writes the infallible, inerrant word of God to reveal God's heart to his people. He says, I'm convinced. I'm convinced. Are you? He's convinced. Of what? Death can't separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. The death, the death is your ultimate victory. Amen? Death is your ultimate reunion. Death is when you get presented to be your, 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 your bridegroom's partner for eternity. Like, death, death is going to bring you their final destination. That's going to separate you from the love of God. Not life, not anything it may bring to you, not angels, not even demons. Will demons attack you? I believe in demons. He's talking about them. I, I, demons are real. They may attack you, tempt you, harass you. It's just noise. They can't separate you from the love of God. They can't steal you. They can't pull you away from God. I, it may feel like that at times. I just think, though, we give way too much credit to Satan and demons to pull us away from the love of God. Not nearly enough press to the ferocious heart of God to keep us safe and for himself. Amen. I mean, read John 10, 27 through 29. Like Jesus was clear. No one can snatch you out of the Father's hand. Uh, read Jude, uh, one chapter, easy read. Uh, Jude, I think it's verses 24 and 25. I think we have those. To him who is able to keep you from stumbling and to present you before his glorious presence without fault and with great joy. To the only God our Savior be glory, majesty, and power and authority through Jesus Christ our Lord before all ages, now and forevermore. Amen. Amen. He's going to get you there. And nothing can separate, not, no demon in hell can separate you from the love of God that is in Christ Jesus. And, and then he continues. Uh, no, uh, nor the present, whatever it looks like, however difficult it may be. It can't separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. No, nor the future, anything that may come your way. It can't separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. The Apostle Paul is convinced. Uh, nothing else, not height, not depth, nor anything else in all creation. He's like, he's like, hey, just in case I miss something. That covers everything, yes? Nothing in all creation can separate you and me as sincere believers from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. That means nothing in all creation can ever cause God to be anything other than for us all the time. Nothing in all creation. Nothing in all creation. The Apostle Paul is convinced nothing in all creation, nothing in all creation would have to be inclusive even of your own sin and your own brokenness and your own weakness and those seasons of life where you struggle. Amen? Nothing can separate you from the love of God that's in Christ Jesus. And that's why the Apostle Paul says in verse 37, we are more than conquerors. More than conquerors. More than conquerors. Because of him who loved us. That, in the Greek, that means like superheroes. It means like super victorious. It means like super abundant overcoming conquerors. That's what he means. He says, how, how? How is that possible? How, well, how could Paul? In prison, beaten, shipwrecked, abandoned. How can he say, I'm more than a conqueror through him who loves me? I'm more than a conqueror. He said, how can I say that? How, how could you say, when, when maybe your life is falling apart or your spouse left you or, or that temptation has risen up or that addiction is pulling you back under or you're sick in your body and everything's falling apart. How, how, can, you, how can I say I'm more than a conqueror? Because of him who loves you. Because God is for you. Because he will always only before you, because you are innocent and uncondemnable in his eyes, because you are his beloved son or daughter, and because nothing can separate you from his love. It might not look like it here and now, but you are more than a conqueror because of him who loved you. And so we, I'm just going to you to stand your feet, and we are just going to, it just seems right for us to end this chapter by simply celebrating together the love of God for us. So Aaron, take us away.
these verses uh, together at one time as we finish singing. What then shall we say in response to these things, asks the Apostle Paul. If God is for us, who can be against us? He who did not spare his own son, but gave him up for us all, how will he not also along with him graciously, generously, and with joy give us all things? He who will bring any charge against those whom God has chosen, it is God who justifies who then is the one who condemns no one Christ Jesus who died more than that who was raised to life is at the right hand of God and is also interceding for us who shall separate us then from the love of God shall trouble or hardship or persecution or famine or nakedness or danger or sword as it is written for your sake we face death all day long we are considered as sheep to be slaughtered no in all these things we are more than conquerors through him who loved us for i am convinced that neither death nor life neither angels nor demons neither the present nor the future nor any powers neither height nor depth nor anything else in all creation will be able to separate us from the love of god that is in christ jesus our lord Grace 
Amen. Amen. Bless you.